Oh guys, it's the Creepin Bookworm and in this again very different video and compared to like normal bookish stuff, I actually want to do a mathematical derivation or rather a proof of a particular equation often called the most beautiful equation in all of mathematics. Now the reason for me doing this is because even when I was in high school, I oftentimes saw this equation and wondered how the heck does one get to this equation and also what did it really imply because I'd often see videos on YouTube of people saying like, oh, this is like the most like the most insightful and deep thing. Like if only you knew how this like worked and such. And I was really jealous. I like I wanted to understand this. And after finally having gathered a little bit more insight as to how these things work, I thought I don't want anyone to go through what I went through in terms of curiosity like having that insatiable curiosity about knowing this thing and never being able to figure out just because you don't have the mathematical tools in your grasp. So in this video, I'm going to give you the mathematical prerequisites that you need to tackle and understand this proof and understand this particular equation as thoroughly as possible without even needing too much fancy math. Like the bare minimum that you need is going to be covered in this video. So all who's just mathematically curious, you're welcome to join us in this particular journey into the number world. First things first, this video, as you can clearly notice, is going to be quite a lengthy video. So again, you have to be really curious to want to really dabble into this, um, but I invite you to give it a shot and it's going to be divided into several sections. Like firstly, I'm going to briefly introduce complex numbers and what they are. Um, and secondly, we're going to be talking about three important functions which are needed for this. And that is the function of e to the x, cosine of x and sine of x. And after talking about those three functions, we're going to talk about some very calculus specific topics. And that is basically what a derivative is, um, some basic der der um, differentiation rules. So differentiation being taking the derivative of a function. And also lastly, talking about two really fancy techniques that you can use called Taylor series and Maclaurin series. They are very fancy names of basically knowing how to write a particular function as a polynomial. So AX, AX squared, etc, etc. After we have all those required tools ready, we're going to actually prove this particular like beautiful equation and then see the relevance of it. So I hope you're curious. Let's jump into it. So first things first is that we want to talk about imaginary number. Now, imaginary numbers are in a nutshell, a number at which the square root is negative one. And that is already quite a big concept in and of itself, because you might be asking how the heck can you have the square root of a negative number? It's like the one rule that you are taught in high school that is not possible. And for the purposes of high school, I would say that that rule is suffice. You don't need to think about imaginary numbers quite often if at all. Though if in your case you did get imaginary numbers in school that don't completely despise them. But let's state this as a rule that actually mathematicians decided to, well, you know what, you can actually have the square root of negative one. So they just decided to make that up and it works just because it works. Though I imagine that might not satisfy all your curiosity. So if you're rather curious, I described some YouTube channels and videos that might be of interest to you. One of the YouTube channel is known as Welch Labs um, and they have videos called Imaginary Numbers Are Real um, and they have several parts of this. Um, I would highly recommend you check them out if you're not satisfied with the answer of just cause um, and actually want like a rigorous like reasoning as to why you can have the square root of negative one. It has to do with a cubic function problem and how two mathematicians when describing a cubic function, a polynomial, um, they found that, oh, in order to actually find the solution for this polynomial, I think at zero, um, they actually had a negative square root and it was um, a very tough challenge until they came up with I. But anyways, so on to the main thing. I is what we call the imaginary number. Well, sometimes electrical engineers use the letter J, but they mean the same thing. That is the square root of negative one. If we have I square, we get negative one. If we have I cube, we get negative I. And if we have I to the power of four, we get one. I to the power of five, we get I. I to the power of six, we get negative one. And you can see that after I to the power of um, I to the power of five, um, or I to the power of six, rather, things just to repeat itself. One last thing before we progress further from imaginary numbers. 
is that we often think of the numbers which we typically describe in something called the real axis and that involves all of the integers all of the natural numbers so natural numbers being zero one two three all of the whole numbers that are not negative integers being all of the whole numbers so one two three four five and negative one negative two negative three etc we have all of the rational functions, um, rational numbers, which are numbers that can be expressed as fractions. Um, we have all of the irrational ones, such as square root of two. Um, um, we have pi, e, all of these um, more interesting, the funky numbers, and together they all make the real numbers. The imaginary numbers, um, or rather um, some of the complex numbers, they exist on a different plane, you could say, but they're very useful um, to describe certain real physical things even. So we shall see that later on. Next up, we want to look at these following three functions, and that is e to the x, um, cosine of x, and sine of x. Um, if you're curious as to why they are drawn this way in more specific detail, I'd suggest looking into the concept of unit circles, and it might take a little bit to get your head around, especially if you haven't gone in unit, unit circles in high school. But with a little bit of um, with a little bit of, of pushing through and with some videos on YouTube, I think you will nail this topic down very easily. But in essence, e to the power of x is an exponential function, and that show you that um, the more um, the bigger x gets, the um, faster this function grows. Think of it. I saw an analogy somewhere on YouTube. Think of it as like something that um, um, e eats food, it eats um, X, you could say, and the more X or the more chocolate, say X equals chocolates, the more X it eats, the bigger its mouth gets. It's a very funny analogy, but it's a nice way to think about it. Um, and cosine of x and sine of x are both, um, they're both periodic functions. So they describe something that oscillates periodically. Say if I have uh, something that is within a lake or within a body of water and it goes up and down, I can use a cosine or a sine function somehow to describe um, its motion throughout a period of time. Now that we have our three functions like um, e to the power of x, cosine x, and sine of x, we're going to be showing actually or proving rather the following equation that is e to the power of i um e to the power of i x i would say is equal to cosine of x plus i sine of x so there are some interesting things to notice here you have a function of e to the power of i x gives us weirdly enough um these two trigonometric functions which are cosine of x plus i sine of x with like a complex with a complex component right there how do we get from this to this and what does this actually tell us in reality that is what we're going to be talking about and what we're going to prove in essence throughout this video before we actually get to the proving we need some prerequisites down and if you if you're someone who's had um, derivatives and a little bit of calculus already this might seem quite familiar to you but if not um, don't worry we're going to go through some of the prerequisites so say if we have our y and our x-axis and we have a function, um, y equals f of x. f of x can be anything that we want. Um, in this case, it's a random polynomial. Um, the, our f of x looks like this. It goes like that. We have two particular points on our polynomial, and that is point A and point B. If we are to draw, draw a line that goes through both point A and point B, a straight line rather, we're going to call this the secant line. And the secant line just has a formula of y equals mx plus b. That's just a, that's just a linear, um, that's just the formula for a linear function. Um, but what we're interested in is this um, value of m because m will tell us how the linear line is going to either increase or decrease. Um, and in the case, in our case, the way in which we will describe the slope m will be the difference in the y, um, the difference in the y values divided by the difference in the x values. Um, hence why the notation for this is the Greek letter delta, and that is delta y over delta x. So this difference will be the final um, y value, so y of b minus y of a over x of b minus x of a. So we're in essence going to be dividing 
um, the difference in the two y values over the difference in the two x values. If we do a little bit of rewriting, we can say that, okay, let's call x of a um, equal, let's say that x of a equals x zero. So that's just, let's just say it's x zero. And we're going to say that x of b equals x zero plus h. So x of zero was our given x of a, but x of b um, is a little bit further than x of b and it's f um, far enough by this letter h. Hence why we say that x of b equals x zero plus h. So it's plus a particular h right here. Um, so I wrote them on the side right here that the y of b, um, the y of of a and the y of b in turn would be just um, the function that we, the y value that we will get by plugging in these x values. So for um, y of a, we would get um, f of x a, so x, um, f of x zero right here. And for um, y of b, we would get um, the y value we, that we will get by plugging in this um, x of b as our x value in the function. So our x of b in this case being x of zero plus h, hence why we get this. Then our slope for the secant line would in essence be y of b minus y of a, because it's our difference in y, um, over the difference in um, x b minus x a. x b in this case would be our x of zero plus h, so this, minus um, x a, which is just x zero. Now, if we um, ignore the brackets or if we take everything outside of the brackets, at least in the denominator, we would get then we would then get x of zero plus h minus x of zero, and um, these two x of zeros then cancel out, and we are left with f of x um, zero plus h minus f of x zero over h. And this particular expression is um, very neat and beautiful. Um, because um, we can then write our slope um, um, of the secant um, line as this particular equation. I think it's called the Newton's, um, Newton's fraction or something along those lines. I'll just write the subtitle in here. Um, it's called that because Newton used the concepts of um, limits then to then describe something known as the tangent line. And the tangent line is in essence just the line that um, just barely touches the function of f of x at one particular point only. And in our case, it's just um, the point A. We can get our um, tangent line, so a line that just touches f of x at one particular point, by taking this secant line and you can see somewhat drawing it nearer and nearer and nearer to point of A. So that's a very qualitative description, but if we were to be more exact, what we're doing is we're finding um, we're finding this difference, you could say, this slope at smaller and smaller intervals. So in essence, what we're doing if we're trying to find this at smaller and smaller intervals is we're taking this point B and dragging it closer and closer and closer and closer and closer to point A up to a point in which the difference would be infinitesimal and almost like negligible, you could say. Um, so think about it for a minute. You can even pause the video very soon. If we are to make this interval smaller and smaller and smaller, what would happen to our h right here? This was our, your cue to pause the video, but if you already did that, or if you already know what's going to happen, good. What happens is that our h is going to tend towards zero because then if our x of b equals x zero plus zero, our x of b would in essence be almost very similar to x of a, meaning our interval is infinitesimally small. Now, there is a mathematical jargon and way that you can describe this, and that being that the slope for our tangent line, so the line that just touches the f of x at point A, it would be m equals, so m similarly to a linear function, um, y equals mx plus b, since it's also a linear, um, just a straight line. The slope for this straight line would be the limit um, of this whole expression right here, as h approaches zero. Um, so that's quite a bit of jargon, I can imagine. But what that just says um, in mathematical terms is if we take this h and make it 
latitude tends towards zero, then we would get a particular y value that correlates to this for this equation. And this y value is what we would call then the derivative of our original function. In our particular case, we would call it the derivative of um, f of x for x equals xa, um, basically, so x of zero. But we can use this concept of derivative um, to find basically how the entire function f of x in essence changes. So at whatever point you're interested in finding how steep it will change or how it will change, you can in essence find what is called the derivative of the function to find out how it changes basically. And that's in essence the definition of a derivative. We're gonna go over some basic rules of um, finding the derivative of a function or let's just say differentiating a function as you would also call like finding the derivative of a function. Um, in order to differentiate a function, say, um, we have our f of x equals a constant. So a constant could be just a number like f of x equals 3, f of x equals 0, f of x equals um, e or pi. Like if it's just a number, then its derivative would just be 0 um, if you differentiate with respect to something. Um, if you want the derivative of, say, uh, a power function, so um, you have a f of x equals um, an a times x to the power of n. This can be, say, something like x squared, where a equals 1 and n equals 2. Then its derivative would be um, n, so this number that was up here, times what was in front to the power of um, n minus 1 or x to the power of n minus 1. So if I were to just have, say, a function of x squared, its derivative would be 2 times x squared and x to the power of 2 minus 1, that's just 1, so 2x would be its derivative then. All right, and, and interestingly enough, the derivative of e to the power of x is just e to the power of x. Um, there are proofs for this, but we're not going to go over them right now, but just remember that the derivative of e to the power of x is just e to the power of x. The derivative of cosine of x is negative sine of x, and the derivative of sine of x is cosine of x. There are some other rules that are important in differentiating. There are quite a bit of them, actually, but um, we just have to go over three of them very, very briefly. And that is if we want to take, for example, the derivative of a function within a function, then we have to do take basically the derivative of the overarching function times the derivative of what's inside here. So for example, I did this as an example. If we have a function e to the i x, in our case, the overarching function is e to the power of something. Like we have e to the power of a random something up here. So we have to take the, the derivative of e to the power of something. And that just gives us, of course, e to the power of that same something. So e to the power of i x in our case. But now we have to time, uh, multiply it by the derivative of what's inside. In our case, that is e to the i, uh, that is i x, and the derivative of i x is like um, this a particular rule that we described. That's going to be just um, i basically. So it will be e to the i x times i in essence. So that's an example of the chain rule. Um, another example of the chain rule would be something like this. So say if we have cosine of x squared, this thing's derivative, um, this thing's derivative would be the derivative of cosine of something, and that's just negative sine of that same something, times the derivative of what's inside here, and that will be just 2x. Easy peasy. All right, the product rule of differentiation is just if you have two functions multiplied by each other, then we have to take um, the derivative of the first function times the function, just the original function, plus the derivative of that other function times, well, the one that you didn't differentiate before. Um, you can just remember this or write it down because we're going to use it later. And the sum rule, which is the easiest one, is that if we have the sum of two functions, then the derivative of this would just be the derivative of each and every function that is within that particular equation. So let's move on now.
reason we talked so much about derivatives um, just a few moments ago is because these derivatives are actually quite handy in describing a function itself. So let's say right now we have a random polynomial that just has a very crazy behavior. How can we describe this polynomial with the use of just derivatives of that same polynomial? Let's just assume that this function is continuous and that you can differentiate it, blah, 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 many technical terms that you don't need to remember. Um, we can try and see if we find its first derivative. Um, so we differentiate this function one time we will have a particular um, function that looks, it does, it's not loosely similar to this function. This was just a rough sketch. It can look, very, it can look very different. Um, if we find the second derivative, we find something else. If we find the third derivative, we find something else, all of which um, they might have some overarching points, but is in essence not quite representative of how this original function look. But if you were to say that, okay, we are going to have a polynomial um, so another, say this is a polynomial number one, and we have polynomial number two, that is the sum of all of these derivatives um, somehow, then you might get something that is a bit more representative of the original function. Um, of course, you can see here it deviates quite a bit, but the point is the more um, terms you have in here, so the more you could say the more derivatives you have in here, the more representative it, this might be of the original function. Um, so you can imagine if I have like 10 derivatives or something, like this might overlap even better with this given function. Um, so Keeping this in mind, there is a trick for finding this polynomial that very closely resembles um, our original function. And in essence, if this goes on to infinity, so you go on and have like infinite many derivatives, you can in essence represent this original function as an expression of these many derivatives. And that is what we're going to look at right now where so with something called power series. Um, so power series are, in essence, say if we want our polynomial, which is going to be like an a of x plus a of x squared plus a of x to the power of 3, etc., etc. The amount of powers that we have just depends on what we want, um, though preferably we want this to blow up to infinity. We're going to say that in order to find this polynomial that we want, this yellow polynomial, the sum of um, a constant to the power of n times x to the power of n, um, the sum of that with n equals zero or sub n equals zero as it goes to infinity um, will be equal to this. This might be a bit of a mouthful. Um, if you haven't been exposed to the sum notation yet, it might seem a bit weird, but what this basically tells us is we're going to use this particular function starting from n equals zero, um, something to the power of something um, as this goes on to infinity. So n1, um, n2, n3, n4, etc., all the way to infinity. That is basically what this notation is telling us. So if we do that at first, we get um, c sub zero, so a particular first constant, times x to the power of zero. x to the power of zero or anything to the power of zero is just one, so you don't have an x in here, so you get just c sub zero plus c sub 1 times x to the power of 1, x to the power of 1 is just x, um, plus c sub 2, x to the power of 2, that's x squared, c sub 3, x to the power of 3, and you do that and it goes on infinitely. Um, we can describe that as a particular polynomial. Um, if we have something right here um, in which instead of x, we have x minus a, but do the exact same thing otherwise, we would have a very similar polynomial expression, um, but instead of, of course, x, we have x minus a, a particular a term right here. This expression is something um, that is something that can lead us to something known as the Taylor series of a function. So it's another way of writing the function, but in terms of polynomials instead of the function that we were given before. Now, what is important for us is actually finding these constants that you see here. So c sub zero, c one, c two, c three, etc., etc. And we can very easily find these by actually plugging in um, x equals a. And I can imagine you can see why, because no matter how long this polynomial goes, even if it goes on to infinity, 
if we plug in x equals a, then all of these will become zero because um, x equals a will give a minus a, and that will be zero, and that will be any constant times zero, and it doesn't matter to the power of what it is, it will still be zero, so basically everything just falls out, and we get c sub zero. So basically, um, if we want to find the first constant, so c sub zero, that would just be f of zero, and actually I've written that on the other paper even. You can literally see how if we plug in um, for x a, we will get the initial constant immediately. Now, what if we wanted to find c1 or c sub 1, the other constant? We can definitely find that. How we can find that is by taking the first derivative of this entire polynomial and taking the first derivative, um, I've done it right here, step by step, will be taking the derivative of, well, each and every bit of the polynomial. So it's the sum rule of finding derivatives. Um, and that will give us the derivative of this particular constant. And that will just be zero since it's just a number um, um, plus the derivative of um, this particular first term. And if you multiply everything inside here, you get C1 times X minus C1 times A. The, this is again the sum rule because because this doesn't have an x term it will just be zero and this will just be c1 so we will get then c1 plus the derivative of this which will be using basically the product the product not the product rule the chain rule in essence because you will do then um two times um this particular thing times the derivative of what's inside inside so times one that will give you two c sub two um, times this minus um, n minus 1, so 2 minus 1, that's just 1, and you repeat that for every other term in the polynomial. Um, so this will give you then, if, so now that you have the first derivative for this entire, entire polynomial, you can say, oh, I can now easily solve for c1, for the first constant, if I say then that in this um, first derivative, x equals a, because same thing as before, if I do x equals equals a, then I will get zero in all of these terms. So AKA, no matter how long this expression goes on, um, all of these things will fall out and I will just get C1. So um, f prime a, so the first derivative of um, this function as we put a as our x value will give us the, for the C1 constant. Um, we can repeat this step again to find for C2, C3, etc. And you will notice a repeating pattern. For example, if we do it with um, the second derivative, um, we take the derivative of this whole thing, we have the second derivative, and we get 2c2 instead of just c2. So then if we take um, the second derivative as x equals a, all of these things will fall out again, but then we will have 2c2 um, um, two two, sub 2. So c sub 2 will then be a half um, times um, the second derivative of fa. Um, so we will have this over 2. If we take the third derivative, which instead of writing it as apostrophes, I just wrote as um, three right here, which is a different notation, but it means the same thing. Um, then we will have um, as our C3 constant, we will have um, F, um, the third derivative um, with X equals A over six, because we get six by the end, um, if you take the derivative of this particular thing. Um, you can write this in another way, and that is, um, you can write this as this thing called um, tree factorial. And tree factorial is just a very fancy notation for if something is like, if you take something factorial in the case of, in this case, it's tree, then you just multiply it by every number that it's smaller to. So in the case of three, you do three times two times one, and that will give you six. If it's four factorial, you get four times three times two times one. Um, if it's 16 factorial, you get 16 times 15 times 14, and that goes on much, much longer and you get a larger number, but that's the gist of this notation that it's factorial. You can notice repeating trends right here, and hence why you can even, by the way, do this um, for C sub zero, which doesn't have this particular notation. But if you do C sub zero, 
then you have that um, the zero to derivative of um, f of x um, with a, the zero to derivative would be just your original function. That would be f of x with x equals a, so f of a, and zero factorial, this might seem very weird, but you can just plug this into a calculator and check it for yourself. Um, zero factorial equals one, so you have then that c sub zero is just f of a. So a very general way of summarizing this um, polynomial that we want is um, the polynomial P of X, we just say we call it, will be the sum of um, the nth derivative um, with x equals a over n factorial with n being the number of derivative that you take um, times x minus a to the power of n again with n being the nth number of derivative that you take. And so here you can see how we express it um, as it goes on and on and on. Now, this is what we know as the Taylor expansion. Now, we spent quite a bit of minutes on it, but that's because we want to spend less time on what is known as the McLaurin series. And the McLaurin series is just a special case of the Taylor series where, um, where um, A equals zero, basically. So we just write everything that has to do with A here as zero. So X minus zero is just X to the power of N. And instead of having like the, um, the nth derivative um, be with x um, equals a, it will be with x equals zero. So we get then that our polynomial will be the sum like this, but with um, f of zero, f prime of zero, um, just times x in our case, since the a falls out, with the second derivative, um, x equals zero times x squared, etc. So if you write that down, then you can see that it's basically the same thing as the Taylor series, just without an A in our case. We're going to find the McLaurin series for um, the three functions that we were talking about before. So e to the x, cosine of x, and sine of x. And if we have the McLaurin series, then we can actually prove Euler's, um, we can prove Euler's um, formula with that. Now we can use this information to find the McLaurin series for the three functions that we talked about before. So these given three functions e to the x cosine of x and sine of x so we can so that we can finally prove this particular weird expression and how there's a correlation between the two so in order to find the McLaurin series or the Taylor series of something, we need to know what its derivative will be. And with e to the x, this is super easy because the derivative of e to the x is just e to the x. So if we were to just substitute everything in here, then you will see that, okay, the zero to derivative of this thing, so just the original function to the power um, with well, with x equals zero, so f of zero for this will just be e to the zero um, over zero factorial, since it's the zero to derivative, times x to the power of zero. Well, these two things are just zero, so it's just one over zero factorial, so it's just one plus whatever is going to come next. And what's going to come next is it's still zero. So for everything here, it will be zero. Um, since the derivative, the end derivative of this, if you continue to differentiate this, will just be e to x. Um, the end, you will get e to the power of zero um, over one factorial times x to the power of one. Same thing times x squared, but with um, two factorial, three factorial, etc etc so the simple expression for this will be one plus x over one factorial etc etc and you can write this even more neatly as just one plus x plus everything that's going to follow next so on this other paper you can see right here how i wrote the mclaurin expansion for e to dx and this is in essence also how euler himself kind of found out about this particular number in some sense um and it's a very beautiful notation for it it's just one plus x plus everything that follows right here um now if you want to find the mclaurin expansion for um sine of x this is going to be a little bit more tricky, but not too tricky, because of course the, we know that these expansions go on to infinity. But one key thing that we have to keep in mind is that with sin, with trigonometric functions, so we'll see sine of x and cosine of x, at some point these der their derivatives will just continue to repeat itself, like in a particular manner.
So in the case of sine of x, we have our original function is sine of x. Its first derivative will be cosine of x. Its second derivative will be the derivative, the derivative of this, which will be just negative sine of x. The third derivative, which is the derivative of this, will be negative cosine of x. And then eventually we bump into its fourth derivative, which is um, sine of x again, which is the same thing as the original function. So after f of f of the fourth derivative, you could say, or after the third derivative, you can see that it just repeats itself. So with the Maclaurin series, we remember that we want to find it for the case of um, this being zero. Um, and that will give us up to the fourth derivative for the first thing, the zero derivative. We will have zero, and then we will have for the first derivative one, second derivative zero, third derivative minus one, and fourth derivative zero. You can pause this again and check it um, if you want to more slowly digest it. But a trend that we can clearly see here is is that which with each of the odd numbered um, with each of the odd numbered um, cases we will have a particular um, value but with the even numbered cases we will have zero so we know that in the Maclaurin expansion we will have something times zero in the numerator so it's going to completely fall out hence why in the Maclaurin expansion for this function sine of x um, here I wrote everything down just for clarity's sake but um, if you look at the even term they all just fall out. So for example, um, with the case of zero, um, this is a little bit of a mistake right here in my writing. So this is supposed to be zero factorial, though it is one, but still. Um, in the case of two, that's going to be zero, four, zero, six, zero, etc. So we're going to see that the Maclaurin expansion for sine of x is going to be x minus x cubed um, over three factorial plus extra power of five over five factorial minus extra power of seven over seven factorial, etc. And this is a repeating trend. You can see two repeating trends again. You can see that with the odd, um, with the odd um, numbered, um, with the odd numbered derivatives, you actually have something while the even ones fall out. And you can also see that it's going to be a plus minus um, exchange every time. So um, you have right here x minus the third derivative part plus um, the fifth derivative um, one minus again here. So you can kind of guess how it's going to continue to go out. Like it's going to be right here um, plus x to the ninth over nine factorial minus x to the 11th over 11 factorial, etc., etc., etc. Um, now for the cosine case, with the cosine is going to be almost a very similar scenario to the sine of x1 because after the um, third um, the third derivative, it's going to repeat itself, which is very nice. Um, you can take a look at this um, for yourself. Um, take it all in because I'm not going to talk to the whole thing. But the conclusion that you can get after writing this whole thing down and calculating it is that in this case, we have a very similar scenario to the um, sine of x, but the only t difference being that in our case, in the cosine of x case, it is the even um, number derivative that are going to show up and the odd ones that are going to fall out, um, the, basically the opposite of this first case. So if you look at the Maclaurin expansion for cosine of x, again, I wrote everything out here for clarity, you can see that basically with um, the even even numbered cases, so with zero, with two, with four, with six, and you can go on and on, you actually get a value, while with the odd numbered ones, they actually fall out, which is pretty nice. So the first thing that we will have right here is the zero the derivative, hence why we get just one here instead of x, because x to the power of zero is just one, so one times one over one, that's just going to be one right here. Um, minus x squared over 2 factorial um, plus um, x, x to the power of 4 over 4 factorial minus x to the power of 6 over 6 factorial and it's going to go on and on. Similar to this one, you can guess how it's going to progress from pl plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus with even numbers. Um, so this is basically what we have and we can now finally go into the actual proof for um, the function. So we have our three, um, we have our three um, Maclaurin e expansions right here for e to the x, sine of x, and cosine of x. 
And now we can actually try to work with um, trying to find um, the proof. So if, for example, instead of e to the power of x, we say that the e to the power of something, the something is going to be i of x, then we will have a very similar um, Maclaurin series for e to the power of x. I wrote it everything right here. But instead of it being um, with x, as the case before, it will be with i of x to the power of something. Hence why the Maclaurin um, expansion for e to the i x will be 1 plus i of x plus, well, um, i of x squared, this, 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 and it goes on and on and on. Now, if you remember the first thing that we wrote about in terms of imaginary numbers, we can see here how each of the imaginary numbers can turn either into i, negative i, 1, or negative 1. So you can literally just compute this by yourself, plug everything in, and see how when you take everything outside of their brackets right here, I assume you know how to do this, that for example, i to the x squared is going to be just x squared times i squared, and you'll see that, okay, it's um, i squared is negative 1. So in essence, this is going to be negative x squared, which you'll see right here written. Um, i to the power of 3 is going to be minus i. And so I, instead of a plus, you get a minus right here. And you work all of these things out. You get a particular um, Maclaurin ex um, expansion for e to the i x. But what is interesting here is if we rearrange this expression for um, all of the imaginary components on one side and all of the real components on another side, we get 1 minus x cubed, um, well, sorry, not x cubed, 1 minus um, x squared over 2 factorial plus x to the power of 4 over 4 factorial minus and plus and minus and plus plus well, all of the imaginary components right here, um, you get all of the, you get i to the x to the power of 3, i to the x to the power of 5, i to the x to the power of 7, etc. And it's going to be a repeating trend because we just, we wrote every, all of the imaginary parts on one side of the equation. So we can take the imaginary number i outside, and I think you can already see the spoiler right ahead of what's going to happen. But if we take i outside of here, if you look at these two Maclaurin expansions separately, you'll notice that they are literally what we wrote for cosine and sine. In this case, the even numbers will be the cosine of x and the odd numbers will be the sine of x. Hence why we can write e to the i x simply as this very condensed thing um, that is um, e to the i x equals cosine of x plus i sine of x. This is also known as Euler's formula, and it's a very powerful thing that you can use in various areas of science, engineering, econometrics, and it goes the list goes on and on. Um, there is a very special case of this as well, and that is going to lead us to what is known as Euler's identity, which is oftentimes what we what they call the most beautiful equation in all of mathematics. If we take for x the number pi, so x equals pi, then we will see that i to the power of pi will be equal to cosine of pi plus i sine of pi. Cosine of pi will simply be negative 1, since so it's 180 degree rotation on a unit circle. If, again, you're not familiar with unit circles, go check that out. Um, and plus i sine of pi. Sine of pi is just 0, so this whole thing, this whole imaginary component is just going to fall out. So it's going to be e to the i pi equals minus 1 plus 0. So e to the i pi equals negative 1. And to write it more beautifully, e to the i pi plus 1 equals 0. Voila, chef's kiss. Um, but this is in essence what is known as the Euler's identity. And this is often the way in which people go about proving this thing. It is using like um, Maclaurin expansions. Though there are, again, different ways of proving it, some very clever ways. Um, so you can play with this if you want. But this is, I hope, a very clear way of understanding how we get from um, from these separate equations to something that correlates them together. Now, why is this quite like insightful? 
So that was basically the proof for both Euler's formula and Euler's identity. And the reason why this thing is so important is if you look at the formula again, you have an e to the power of i x in there. And it basically correlates like angles to the an exponential, which is a very interesting and weird, peculiar thing. Um, you have basically, oh, if something has 180 rotation, you're going to get negative one. Um, and you get that from using Euler's number and an imaginary number, which is two things that you don't often think about combining, like an imaginary number with like an, a real number. And it's not just mathematically interesting, but it is also useful and applied oftentimes in like real life scenario. Um, for example, in electrical engineering, um, I already mentioned about J and um, those other notations for imaginary numbers, but there are often things called phasers, which um, kind of really nicely describes voltage, resistance and such. And you can use literally um, these imaginary numbers to kind of get a really nice and estimation of what you would get if you measure a particular like signal from an electronic device. There is a really more in-depth video about this from a channel called the Science Asylum, which like all the other like all of the other videos, I will put it in my description below as it's very interesting if you're curious about this type of thing. And the simple fact that you can converge from an exponential function to a trigonometric function and vice versa allows you to express one equation in ways that are handier to work with. For example, if I have a function that is a cosine of t, so it gives me an oscillation as a function of um, time, I can actually use this thing called the Laplace transform to find its frequency somehow. And intuitively, this can be a very, very handy thing to use, for example, in physics, if you're talking about vibrations and waves. Say, if you have an earthquake that is shaking a building, you can describe um, several things that are happening here as something known as a differential equation, which is just an equation filled with a lot of derivatives. And sometimes these e equations, like say, if they're showing how the building is shaking and then slowly coming to a stop. It can be, if you were to graph this out, it can be a function that is both a sinusoid and a exponential decaying function, which would look something like this. I think it will put a picture for more clarity. This thing we just call the Laplace transform allows you to take the exponential bit from the um, sinusoidal bit, and you can actually have a clearer picture of what the heck is happening. Similarly, you can use another operation called the Fourier transform, which basically allows you to take a sinusoid that can look really crazy or just any oscillating function. So say if you have like a lot of people talking in a room, you can take all of this noise and split it up into different sinusoid function. And you can clearly see, oh, where is like the A tone? Like if you like music, like where is the A note like in this um, graph or where is the B flat or where is this or where is that? Which is very nice because this kind of makes your life much easier. And especially if you're using computer to figure things out. And lastly, besides like electrical engineering or fancy techniques that you can use to analyze your data for something, this um, particular like fun identity or um, formula often comes forth in fundamental physics, like in quantum mechanics. Like oftentimes you will see things such as the Schrodinger equation, which tells you like what is the total energy of a particle given like certain conditions, you can literally see um, the complex numbers popping by and particularly things that has to do with E. So whenever you see this in there, you know that, uh, for example, the, the Schrodinger equation itself, which describes like the wave function or the probability distribution of a particle, you can literally describe this in terms of its oscillation in the real axis and the imaginary axis. I will put a gif for, of this like for clarity somewhere around here. So despite me having a mocking tone of like the people that said like this is the most insightful thing at the beginning of this video, it is a still very interesting like identity and very useful thing to know about, especially if you're interested in going into an area that is very heavy quantitative in which you know that you will have to do a little bit of higher and further math. And even if not, if you're just curious about mathematics in general, I think it's just a very mind blowing thing to do, especially once you um, proving this for yourself, especially if you nail down the topic of derivatives, um, McLaurin and Taylor series, and attempt to do this whole proof for yourself. It's a very mind blowing experience that I think most of you will appreciate. Um, thank you for paying attention to this very lengthy video and I hope you enjoyed it. Bye.